This is uh, Jeffrey Rickman. This is my Plain Spoken podcast, and today I'm joined by my new friend, Collins Ako. Did I say Ako correctly? Yeah, you did. And your middle name is Echi? It's, yeah, Echi. Collins Echi Ako. Which is, is, yeah, which is different from Sketchy. Yes, I would hope so, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Collins is is a missionary... Uh, originally from Cameroon, currently serving in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, He is uh, a United Methodist missionary. The whole point of this service, uh, this uh, series that I'm doing is to uh, seek the voices and insights of people who are on the continent of Africa, who can speak for different constituencies in Africa. Um, I did not expect for you to speak for the whole continent. I think that that would be unreasonable, but I've spoken with individuals from uh, Liberia and Nigeria and Uganda, and uh, there are many other countries and uh, cultures in Africa that I have not spoken with yet. Um, You will be able to represent um, your home country of Cameroon and where you came from, as well as the constituency you serve there. Um, The United Methodist News Service, uh, Collins, did a, a profile on you um, I don't. It was only three weeks ago or so. How did you feel about that? I I feel like I feel like it's a wonderful way to share the story uh, about what God is doing here at my missionary placement site uh, with within the United Methodist Connection, and uh, because very often the story that gets out there is only story of war stories of crime, stories of uh, sexual abuse, and uh, not much is said about the wonderful programs and projects that have been implemented here uh, to ameliorate the well-being of the people here. So I think it was a a wonderful uh, opportunity for UM News to get get that story out there. Yeah, and you're you're right about um so in American media we have a saying that if it bleeds it leads which uh is uh if if it involves violence or anger or fighting we report those stories. We don't report as many of the stories of people humbly and joyfully serving and and getting good work done. Um today being Thanksgiving here in America, I just want to say I'm thankful uh for people who serve as missionaries like you and the ways that you pour your your lives out for uh, the less fortunate. Um, Perhaps it would be helpful. Could you describe to us uh, your mission field um, in just a couple minutes? You don't have to tell us every, everything, but what kind of, what is, what kind of people are you with in your daily life? What kind of people are you serving? So first of all, Jeffrey, because uh, today is uh, Thanksgiving, like you said, I, I just want to say how much I'm grateful for this opportunity to get to serve alongside some wonderful church leaders here in the East Congo Episcopal area. Mm-hmm. And uh, like you rightly said, I'm a global ministries missionary seven years in the East Congo Episcopal area in uh, a context of post-conflict church and community reconstruction and development. So the, the people I serve with and the people I serve alongside uh, church leaders they are also uh, vulnerable people within the communities where I serve. Uh, they are ordinary people and they are extraordinary people in different ways. And some of them are very vulnerable and uh, some of them are just great leaders to work with. So the, the, so uh, tell me the name of the towns that you're serving in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, has four uh, episcopal areas. So I'm actually serving with one of the episcopal areas, which is the East Congo Episcopal area, under the leadership of uh, Bishop Unda Gabriel. And uh, the East Congo Episcopal area is mostly parts of Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo with uh, major cities like uh, Kindu, uh, Goma, uh, Kisangani, Bukavu, 
And recently, Goma has been very, very popular because it's been on the news uh, in relation with uh, the resurgence of uh, some violent conflicts within that part of the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay. So as a missionary, are you primarily working in just one or two of those towns or villages or cities, or are you all over that, that region? So I will put it like the bishop uh, <laughs> says, I serve the East Congo Episcopal area. So I work on different projects within different localities within that Episcopal area. And uh, this would range from uh, teaching uh, at the Methodist University in Kindu and in Tunda, which is in the Manyema province, to working with uh, the Goma Orphanage, which is in the North Kivu area, and also um, doing some mentoring and uh, uh, leadership training in the Kisangani area, which is also in a different area. Okay, this is helpful. When I read the article, I wasn't in time. It was clear to me that you had worked in many different missionary settings. I wasn't sure how broad your mission was right now. Okay. So uh, to hear you speak about your 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 missionary appointment, your your job is very broad. Um, do you have an office? Is that where you are right now? So right now I am in the comfort of my sitting room. <laughs> the the greater and the kids are out. Uh, one of our sons is dancing for a program today, so they've gone out to support him. Uh, so, but basically, when depending on where I find myself, so I I have an office space in the East Congo Episcopal office, mm -hmm. which is in Kindu. So when I'm in Kindu, I would walk from that office and uh, stay at the uh, Episcopal guest house. When I'm in Goma, <laughs> I would walk from uh, the office there. And when I'm in Kinshasa, uh, which is a different Episcopal area, mm -hmm. uh, under the leadership of uh, Bishop uh, Lunge, I have an office space here also. So, so just depending on where I find myself, I would find a place to get work done. So how closely do you work with the bishops in those two areas? So I would say I have a, a wonderful working relationship with uh, Bishop Unda of the East Congo Episcopal area where I am assigned. But I also have some good relationship and a wonderful re working relationship actually with the Bishop of uh, the Central Congo Episcopal area, Bishop uh, Lunge. And uh, I know Bishop Mande from his time at Global Ministries. So we also get to do some work together. So I would say out of the four Episcopal areas, I have a work relationship with three out of the four. Great. But I am assigned to the East Congo Episcopal area. I understand. Um, in an interview I did with a gentleman from Nigeria last week, he spoke about, um, I could have, he did he did say the name of the bishop, and I do not recall in this moment, but he said that we have a bishop serving, I believe, in the DRC who actually lives in the United States at this point. Is, is that, are you aware of any of the bishops there who are, who are serving there, but they're living in the United States? Is that, is that a real thing, or is that just a rumor? I mean, I would say at this point I cannot confirm because I've not specifically asked that question to the bishop in question. So I cannot uh, confirm, but okay. I cannot affirm either. Okay. I mean, I cannot, I cannot affirm because I don't have the information that would permit me to do that. I understand. It just seemed strange to me, but also I, my bishop, I serve in uh, the state Oklahoma, but he lives in the, the state Texas, but he also serves in Texas. So that makes sense to me. But I, I, I had never considered that there may be bishops that perhaps do not live in their Episcopal areas. That seemed interesting. Um, let's talk more about you, though, because you can speak very uh, well about you. Uh, I'm curious, uh, the training that you've gone through to become a missionary in the United Methodist Church, how much of that training have you done 
on the continent of Africa? And then how much have you, where have you come in the United States? What kind of training have you done here? What time have you had with Americans? So I would say uh, with reference to classroom training, my I have a, a bachelor's degree in uh, political sciences from uh, Yaoundé University, that's in Cameroon. And I have a bachelor's degree also in uh, geology from the Protestant University of Central Africa. Geology. Where I also okay. have a double master's from there, one in geology and the other one in peace and development. Okay. And uh, I'm presently uh, concluding a doctorate in organizational leadership from uh, Asbury Geological Seminary. In uh, Wilmore, Kentucky? Yes, Wilmore, Kentucky. Oh, great. Yeah, my, my brother went there. Uh, so, yeah, they have wonderful online options for uh, engagement. So uh, have you had to actually be there for anything? Yes. Okay. So uh, the my program is such that I get to go to the U.S. once every year for two weeks. So I've done that for three years. And so I'm done with all of the coursework. So basically what I'm doing now is uh, finishing with my dissertation with the hope of uh, graduating soon. Are you long term in your uh, have you just been following the Lord wherever he leads you? Or do you have aspirations for um, serving the church in other capacities? So at this point, I think I'm just looking forward to where God leads mm -hmm. with the new opportunities that I've had over the last four years uh, to receive uh, additional graces and skills and gifts. Mm -hmm. So I'm just looking forward to where God leads. Yes, that makes sense. Um, I'm wanting to go in two different directions. One is the the nuts and bolts of mission work. And I think I'll start there, and then I'll go more towards the big picture, how can Americans be good friends to, to people in Africa. Um, with mission work in Africa, the, the impressions that people often have in the West is that there is much greater need there than here, that, that people's average income is lower, that there is uh, less production, um, just more need. And so there are not just food, but infrastructure projects, uh, other things that are needed, orphanages, care for people who've been through traumatic uh, stuff, a lot of stuff you've talked about. Um, one of the gentlemen I interviewed was uh, Ande Emmanuel in Nigeria, and he's writing on Facebook right now about uh, a project of establishing a radio tower in um, the capital city there, Abuja. Um, mm. And he's frustrated right now because a United Methodist grant came through and everything should have been built and completed. They're only halfway through, and the grant is spent, and he doesn't. he's frustrated that that's happened. I wondered if you could speak at all to um, what, one of the other concerns that often people have, well, around the world, not just in Africa, but also here, is corruption um, and, and um, money being transferred in a leaky bucket, maybe, or uh, who knows what's happened. But how much of the mission work there do you think— does does Ande's frustration represent a lot of the mission work and the, the dollars that go over there? Or do you think that that is just an exceptional thing and really United Methodist missions happen very effectively and, and things get completed more often than not? What do you say to all that? What are your thoughts? So I, I would uh, first of all uh, like to say that the needs are... Uh, in every community mm -hmm. and uh, i got i got to discover that during my very first visit to the u.s and right yeah that even uh led me to a point where i have a lot of respect for all of uh, my friends in the u.s who have been supporting different projects in africa mm -hmm. because uh during my time in the u.s i got to discover that uh there's poverty in the U.S., <laughs> that there's uh, uh, difficulty accessing healthcare in the U.S., and that the U.S. also has its uh, challenges. It's not 
paradise on earth. Mm -hmm. But even in the midst of all those challenges, we have friends in the U.S. who are willing to go an extra mile to fight the poverty in our communities in Africa, to mm -hmm. fight the injustices in our communities in Africa, which for me is uh, a great sign of love. And uh, so I would say that to for me to say <laughs> that all of what comes in for projects is used on project projects would be an exaggeration. Just like every other system, it's difficult to check where every penny goes. Right. So I would say there are situations where uh, all of what comes in is used for uh, for the purpose for which it was intended. Mm -hmm. I would also say uh, that uh, there could be situations where uh, what comes in gets a redesignation sure. without going through the proper channels. And that could be considered as uh, mismanagement because it did not go through the proper channel to get that redesignation, and it could be considered as uh, as uh, mismanagement. But I would also say, uh, just like every other system which is which is not perfect, there could be situations where funding, which is intended for a specific project, mm -hmm. uh, ends up in the pocket of uh, an individual, or part of it ends up being used for other purposes for which it was not intended. Sure. Yeah, but I think uh, well, and most, that most of our churches, most of our churches are working hard to put in place uh, mechanisms in collaboration with some of our donor organizations, mm -hmm. mechanisms in place that could check for uh, such uh, ill practices. I yes, well, and this is a frustration in all organizations in every culture and land because um, it's. Uh, it can be very tedious to try and move money around transparently and with all the right people knowing, and, and that's something that even small churches struggle with in America. Um, let's talk about things that you love. Um, what about your role as a missionary do you absolutely love right now? Where do you get your joy? So I would say that <laughs> there are days when I wake up celebrating my call mm -hmm. but there are also days when i wake up questioning my call and wishing i was in a different place mm -hmm. but overall there are lots of uh, reasons to celebrate uh serving alongside the local leadership here and participating in uh different projects aimed at reconstructing the east Congo episcopal area from its ruins for example, uh, one of the areas where I have found great joy is uh, working alongside the leadership of the Mamalin Center. Uh, the Mamalin Center is a center uh, that helps girls and women victims of uh, sexual violence mm -hmm. deal with the trauma, but they don't end there. They also help these girls to gain skills that could help them develop small businesses. And uh, so, I mean, one of my greatest joy has been just serving alongside the leadership at this center, and most especially uh, uh, Mama Judith and uh, uh, Mama, the, 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 the East, Congo, East Congo Episcopal area, the bishop's wife. Mm -hmm. She's the director of the center. So uh, Mama Marie Claire, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I mentioned her name. She, she's doing some wonderful work out there in Kindle. And uh, so one of my greatest joys is uh, just being part of that. But another thing I wake up every day celebrating, and you would understand partly because of the opportunities I've had uh, when it comes to academia, is just uh, the opportunity to get to teach at the Faculty of Theology in the East Congo Episcopal area. And um, some of the students are coming from very remote areas and they've been to schools that uh, the standard is not really very high. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so for me, it's an opportunity for them to get to listen to something different. Very good. Yeah. So I think when people imagine missionaries, they imagine a lot of on the ground work with um, people that are actively suffering. And it sounds as though you're surely getting that, but a lot of your time is spent in more uh, administrative and academic settings as well. Am I right in understanding it that way? So, I mean, I would say to some extent, putting it that way paints uh, part of the picture of what I do. Mm -hmm. But uh, something I also do is just serve with the people. So uh, be part of their struggles. So this at times implies <laughs> traveling nine hours on the back of a motorbike on unpaved road during the rainy season. Mm -hmm because that's the road they would take to sure. go back and forth. And uh, at times it would imply uh, uh, walking alongside technicians as they dig trenches to move portable water from one site <laughs> to another area. And so I would say it's hands-on, yes. but it's also partly academic and partly administrative. You're very versatile. We're blessed to have you. Thank yes. Um, so um, you uh, have worked a lot with local Africans on the ground. Of course, you, you were born in Africa, This is, but you also have extensive experience with Americans, and in America, you can speak to some of the struggles that we have that is particular to us. Um, many Africans to whom I've spoken they're very polite about it. Nobody is, is mean-spirited, but I, they, they have said that the material conditions are so different between Americans and, and Africans that, that Westerners in particular um, don't necessarily share the same concerns as people in, in uh, average African context. Do you think that there, there is more in common between us whenever it comes to daily concerns and, and values? Or do you think that um, there is a lot culturally and materially that separates us and that, that makes it difficult for us to understand one another? I, I would say we have, we have a lot in common, but we also have a lot that gives us our specific identities as persons living in Africa and persons living in Europe and in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I wouldn't blame those who don't see it that way because I did not always see it that way. I mean, the, the America a lot of us see on television is so something happened with the electricity. <laughs> I saw your eye. I thought someone startled you. So, yeah, I got I got frightened. <laughs> so, so, so I would say I would say that uh, I did I, I did not always see it this way, and it's it's interesting how much we get to understand uh, our context by getting into that context and living with the people. Uh -huh. Because, I mean, you would you would easily think that uh, John, who is in Texas, gave $1,000 because he has $100,000 and he has no struggles, which is, which is not true when you get to sit with John and you understand his struggles uh -huh. and you understand the sacrifice he's making in the process of making that donation. Mm -hmm. you you get to understand that it's 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 not out of abundance <laughs> it's out of sacrifice and the same with other issues within that context you you can also get to think that a, a america would be a corrupt free zone which is which is not the case right based on the news we hear mm -hmm. you can tell that america also struggles with corruption america mm -hmm. also struggles with embezzlement America also struggles with some of the issues that uh, Africa struggles with, but just at a different level. I would say the, yeah. the difference is at the level of uh, depending on the specific uh, item in question. Well, I, I want to come back to that 
I want to talk about something else you love, and this is what I appreciated about the article about you was uh, there was a, a John Wesley quote you you've clung to, which is the world is my parish, which of course um, was in the context of his bishop getting on to him because he was preaching in areas he shouldn't be preaching outside of his parish, and mm-hmm. he said, you know what, the world is my parish. I'm I'm going to preach wherever I want, um, and you have a wonderful uh, missionary. A field now where you get to serve in very different contexts, very much like John Wesley. I wondered, um, I, I spoke last week with a gentleman in Nigeria, uh, Sati Absalom, and I asked him what he loved about the Wesleyan tradition, the Methodist tradition that that none of the other traditions around there hold. Why, I, you know, I'm curious, why would Africans want to cling to Methodism whenever it comes with uh, these annoying Americans? And um, I didn't say it like that, but I, I asked him, what do you love about Methodism? And without missing a beat, he said, holiness. Holiness is what we cling to. Holiness is what we preach that, that the other denominations don't necessarily preach. And so I wondered how much that speaks to you, that, that, that hunger, that love of holiness, and then what else about the Methodist tradition you love and, and cling to? So I would I would even push it uh, further, but before I push it further, uh, with reference to holiness, uh, I just wanted to share with you that I was not born uh, a Methodist, so I became a Methodist at the age of uh, nineteen, mm-hmm. and so from my childhood right up to nineteen, I was a Presbyterian, and uh, most of my Presbyterian faith was the faith of my mother. So I went to church because my mother went to church Mm -hmm. and uh, she enrolled me for different programs so I would participate. So I was a Presbyterian without conviction. Mm -hmm. That's how I love to put it. So it was not my desire to become a Presbyterian. I became a Presbyterian because my mother was a Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the age of 19, I met some friends at the university and they were attending a a Methodist church. And this might have nothing (laughs) to do with uh, Wesleyan principles and all of that. Mm -hmm. But this was a small classroom church. It Mm -hmm. was a very small church. And for the first time, I had that personal relationship with the pastor, which I did not have with the pastor in my mother's church. Mm -hmm. And so the pastor would call me by my name, the pastor would look forward to seeing me next Sunday. And I, I, I mean, I felt like I was part of something. I was part of a community that I really belonged. Mm-hmm. So that's how I became a Methodist. It was not based on the Wesleyan tradition and all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, my understanding of uh, Methodism came later. So I did not join because I knew what Methodism is all about. Mm-hmm. I joined the Methodist Church because I felt welcome. Sure, yeah. That's all. Yeah. And then later on, uh, gained some uh, insight to what Methodism is all about. And partly because of the struggles I was going through with other members of my family who were not Methodists, who did not even know the Methodist Church, but who at this point would call the Methodist Church a sect because this was a new church in that context. Mm -hmm. And so I got interested into uh, reading some books about Methodism and just getting to know more Mm -hmm. about this new community that I was now a part of. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, like it was said in the article, one of the things that really drew my attention was the world is my parish, because that is the statement that would even help me at some point to understand my specific calling within this new community. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is uh, social holiness. That's why I said I was going to push a little bit further with reference to uh, the holiness statement, the other Mm -hmm. person you interviewed said. Mm -hmm. So the social holiness thing got me curious. (laughs) I wanted, so my my understanding of uh, holiness before becoming a Methodist was a a, a life of uh, a life of how would I say it a life of scarcity where you refrain from a lot of things 
because you want to get a certain posture. Mm -hmm. And that posture for me was holiness at that point. That that wonderful relationship with God where nothing else matters, mm -hmm. just your relationship with God and your respect and obedience uh, towards the word of God. Mm -hmm. And then I fell on this other quotation from, uh, from, from John Wesley uh, that says, there is no religion that is not social, mm -hmm. no holiness that is not social. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, this is just what I see these people practicing when they come from the U.S. on mission trips. It's for me that social holiness, mm -hmm. leaving your context, and because you are part of a community, uh, feeling concern about the needs in this other community, which is part of your connection. Mm -hmm. That social holiness, leaving your faith within a group and trying to address issues that are affecting all of you within that group. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I mean, I felt attracted to that statement and uh, that, that's been part of the basis for my service as a missionary. Uh, emptying myself within this community where I've been called, trying to promote social holiness as we address issues of uh, poverty, issues of injustices and others. That, that all... Uh... I, I similarly came to the Wesleyan tradition later in life. I was born into it, but they didn't talk about um, early Methodism, John Wesley, the, the context of the Wesleyan revival. I only discovered that in seminary and found, oh, I really am a Methodist. Um, I, I really love the second quote that you brought up, there is no religion but social religion. Um, and I didn't learn the context of that till seminary because... Uh, Similar to, you know, maybe in Africa they don't have many people like this, but in, in America there are people who say, I love Jesus, but I don't need a church. Uh, they, they get turned off by other Christians, and so uh, in John Wesley's day they called themselves holy solitaires, or maybe he just called them that, I don't know. But these holy solitaires believed that they could follow Jesus just fine on their own, and Wesley was arguing with that, saying there is no religion. You cannot follow Jesus without being connected socially to other people. So I would actually say, um, and you, hearing about how you came to the Methodist tradition, stepping into a church where people actually knew and loved one another, that is distinctly Methodist. Methodism reclaims the early church intimacy that was felt, and then that's why John Wesley put people into class meetings where they had to get to know one another and walk together in faith. And so I, even though uh, that's not necessarily an academic understanding of Methodism, I, as I hear about what brought you to Methodism, I think that's wonderful because I think that's what the majority of people experienced when they came into Methodism. They, 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 they came to an intimate group that was actually trying to live out the faith as it was given. Um, you, as you talk about social holiness, the, the things that I put on to that from my context is an understanding of social justice and doing good, being more, uh, perhaps more concerned with uh, achieving material uh, success, well-being, rather than a concern for right belief or right faith. Um, that's the way it's broken down in America. There, there's per people who are much more concerned with personal holiness and people much more concerned with social holiness. And of course, there's a lot of movement in between those two. Very few people care only about social holiness. Very few people care only about personal holiness. But um, this kind of ties into the larger topic that, that you and I were talking about, where uh, yes, African Methodists and American Methodists all have our own struggles, all have... Um, scarcity, all have conflict, but the, the sense I've gotten from some African brothers I've spoken to is because America is so materially wealthy, we really don't have the same struggles. Like, um, we don't have a hard time paying our pastors a living wage. There are some pastors who would say 
but there are pastors in Africa who don't have a car. They, they don't even have a bike, you know, so we, we take bike collection. I think I saw an article about in the DRC uh, passing out 100, 150 bikes. Um, there are people still worried about where their next meal comes from in Africa. Uh, my understanding is most African nations don't have a social safety net. Does the government send checks to people who are uh, struggling? I, I mean, I, I'm still waiting for mine. <laughs> okay, so, so, so the the understanding, um, you know, there there are still all kinds of conflicts and struggles in Africa that, for the most part, in America exist very little. So, for that reason, the way many Africans have understood it is that Americans have invented new problems to be anxious about. Humans need to be anxious, so we just invent problems. And so that's where gender ideology came from. That's where the the, the hand-wringing around um, anti-racism and, and having all the right people sitting in all the right places based on skin color. We call it the culture war here. Um, how much of that, you know, and that's where the, the divide in our denomination is. We have liberal people who want to be very concerned about um, anti-racism and homosexuality and lifting up sexual minorities and not discriminating at all. And then we have right-leaning people who want to focus more on holiness and intimacy. And uh, both of these crews want to do mission work, but they want to do mission work very differently. And so as uh, you've gotten to grow up in an African context and be around a uh, that you've gotten to see Americans in the academic context and in the the church context. As you navigate all this, where do you find yourself? And then, yeah, I'm going to give you a lot of time on this one. What do you think people on both sides misunderstand? Or do you think we generally understand it pretty well and the the conflict we have is is a real conflict? How how do you personally navigate it? How how do you think through these things, and then how 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 do you think our denomination should move forward? So I, I would I would want to say that I I strongly I strongly adhere to another of John Wesley's uh, statement, uh, which is "Do no harm, do good, do no harm." And, uh, and do no harm for me is for every situation, every circumstance, and in every context. And it's not just uh, uh, do no harm for people in this area and harm for people in this area. And I think, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very careful the way I say it, because Unfortunately, there have been this tendency about people playing with what people say mm -hmm. and not understanding where where people come from before saying the things they are saying. Right. And uh, we, we've been very quick into uh, putting people into uh, groups. And at times we don't even ask the opinion. We put them into a group that is for or into a group that is against sure or at times into a group that is even neutral when in reality that's not their position so i would i would first of all say my position on uh, the present situation with uh united methodist church is we all have to do everything possible not to cause harm and this is not just on one side it's from both sides i mean all of us have to be trying our best to do everything that would cause no harm to the church mm -hmm. no harm to different communities and I, I feel like this is not being done in the right way there's been a lot of uh, pol polarization mm -hmm people shifting to sides and then affirming the position of the side and trying to get their way by all costs. And I think that's, in reality, the real problem with our connection now. We we want to have winners and we want to have losers. Mm -hmm. And 
I think it's uh, Yuan Galtung who says, in any crisis <laughs> where <laughs> members within a community are trying to find who is going to be the winner and who is going to be a loser, mm -hmm. in reality, all of them are losing. But we want to get to a position where all of us are winning. And that's something I've not been seeing a lot in the crisis that the church has been going through. And part of this, based on my understanding and some of the research and conversations that I've had, is because people uh, would engage in conversations and they want to hear what they want to hear. Right. They yeah. don't want to hear what you are saying. Mm -hmm. So they, they would act at times as if they are listening, but what they're actually waiting is to hear what they want to hear right. and not what you are saying. Yeah. And context context has a big role to play in our understanding of how we move forward, but also in our understanding of how we got here. Right. And part of the challenge within the connection has been uh, homogeneity. We are we are all members of a connection, but we are coming from different places, mm -hmm. <laughs> different challenges, different perspectives. So how do we harmonize all that differences mm -hmm. into a rich diversity that does not really change our identity as a people call uh, a Methodist? Right. I think that's, that's something we've not done very well. For example, I mean, I was at a meeting where uh, somebody, and this was right after the 2019 uh, special called uh, conference. Mm -hmm. And because I am black, <laughs> visiting a predominantly white church mm -hmm. and speaking with the accent that I'm using, somebody dared to say, you are, Collins, you are, voted this mm -hmm. and i think you said it correctly from the start of our conversation i might pretend to represent the people where i serve mm -hmm. the church where i'm coming from but even that will be very pretentious because even the people from my country of origin mm -hmm. they are very di there's a lot of diversity mm -hmm. Even within the context where I'm serving, there's a lot of diversity. So it will be pretentious on my part to say I'm even representing just these two communities, not to talk about representing a whole continent sure. and taking the blame for a continent. Right. So, and I mean, I, I continue to pray for the person who made this statement even today. Mm. But this helped me to understand that this is a big issue within the church. We try to attribute positions based on our own understanding of uh, this or this context. So I would say at this point, we need to understand that uh, different parts within the connection have their own history. They have their own stories. Mm -hmm. They have their own culture. Mm -hmm. They have diverse contexts within a general context in that specific area. And it's it will be pretentious to act as if we want to harmonize all of that into one way of seeing things or one way of not have. Right. Well, so I think pretty much everyone I know would agree that our contexts are different and that in in ur urban Congo is going to look different from urban Eastern United Methodist or Eastern America versus West Coast America. There are going to be different cultural norms, practices that, that present different challenges. But I, I think where the disagreement currently is, is are all of us called to the same identity in Christ? 
where we minister differently in different contexts to draw people to a common identity, or are we seeking only to draw people to some kind of better identity for their region? So, so many African brothers I've spoken with, I and they believe when we are entirely sanctified, we will perfectly fit together in one culture, one movement, um, because we will have the same mind that is in Christ Jesus. But I think what many people are wanting to imagine is that in America, we can minister to allow people, to bless people to be one way that is very differently, very different from how we're ministering to people in Africa. So specifically, as I read the Bible, the, the biblical picture for how humans need to handle our sexual identities and feelings is we need to be constrained, controlled, and it's only within very strict confines of marriage that, that sexuality can be okay. But there are many in my culture who would say sexuality is a gift no matter how it's oriented, no matter how it's expressed, and marriage is not necessarily an important part of that. Those would be two fundamentally opposed, you know, um, visions of what human sexuality looks like. And human sexuality exists in every culture of the world. It's not, it's not as though only Americans are sexual and Africans are not sexual. No, we all have sexual desires and impulses. So when we have two fundamentally opposed groups, one based on affirmation and acceptance and another based on um, conformity and warning and self-governance, self-control, these two things cannot fit. And I think you're totally right that many people do not engage in this conversation in good faith. They just want to win, you know. Um, and I think that there are many people who, who want to dehumanize the people they disagree with and take away from them their particularity or their story as to why they feel that way. I think listening is something – well, that's why I started this series, to be honest with you, is I think we need to listen to one another and learn from one another, and make sure we're actually hearing one another. Um, as you bring up the 2019 General Conference, the thing I assume as you bring to it is, generally speaking, the African representation voted against the proposal of the bishops and the connectional table, voted in favor of the traditional plan, which maintained a conservative traditionalist understanding of human sexuality. And so what I'm imagining is you went to a left-leaning American white congregation where there was frustration with how Africans generally voted, and, and this gentleman or, or lady felt comfortable putting that on you as well, which of course is wrong. But generally speaking, the impression I get is that Africa overwhelmingly... Um, so when you come to the issue of harm, with, within the Western context, what we are finding is many people who are very sensitive, very easily offended, who easily take issue with many things, and, and even words can be harmful to them, saying the wrong terms. So, uh, for example, when a person is a transsexual and they say, I no longer identify with my, my body, my, my chromosomes, now I am this other, and you will call me by a different name, or, and you will use different pronouns with me. So we have um, a, a phenomenon where it's considered violence to call them by their old name. It's called dead naming, um, or uh, it's, it's considered violence to call them by their old gender. It's called uh, misgendering. And these are things that people get very upset about. Um, so I understand when many African brothers look at us and go, you guys have gone crazy. We can't be in relationship with you anymore. Uh, you're, you're changing the very nature of of human experience and, and how we relate together. So as at least personally for me, as I look upon this, I see that yes, there are many bad actors, but I also see this is a worthy conflict. This, this is a real, this is not, is it more important to feed the homeless or minister to women who've been abused? Like those are both good things. We can do both things. I don't think we can have both visions of human sexuality and minister effectively to the world. And so as I've understood it, the Christmas covenant, even though it has included African and Filipino voices, I understand it to be a Western effort to remove African voices from the conversation so that they can have their way 
with uh, revising our sexual ethics in America. Um, and and I, I wonder if you think that perhaps I've misunderstood that situation or, um, or if I've if, if I've misunderstood the African context or the African voices, as I present all that to you, does all of that sound acceptable, or do you think that, they're, that I need to uh, re-examine some of these things? What do you think? So I would say, based on uh, some of the conversations that I've been engaged in, uh, the, the Christmas covenant is not removing the voices of Africans or isolating them from the conversation. It's placing different groups within the connection in their context. Mm -hmm. So uh, contextual conversations can happen, mm -hmm. connectional conversations can happen, and then we can all continue making disciples for the transformation of the world. Mm -hmm. And Africa is not having, and, and uh, like I said, it might be pretentious on my part to speak for, for, for Africa, but understand when I say this, based on the places I have been to in Africa, mm -hmm. we are not having the conversation about sexual identity at the same level as the church in the U.S. is having. Right. Yeah. And I, I think it is simple evidence even from the number of churches that are going through disaffiliation in the U.S. and the number of churches that are going through the same process in Africa. Mm -hmm. you, you can't even compare the figures. I was so under the impression that, that churches can't disaffiliate in Africa. Did I misunderstand? I, I would... The... They don't have that provision to go through that process. Right. But I would say if, if, even if, even if, based on what I see, even if they had that provision, mm -hmm. most of them would see mission as a priority and not disaffiliation as a priority as for now. Sure, yeah. So our priority is how do we get the church to that level where it is uh, uh, self-supporting, where it is <laughs> making disciples for Christ, where it is uh, participating in efforts and the fight of injustice, uh, poverty alleviation and things like that. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, that's, that's the concerns for this context at this time. Well, and my understanding is I, in the African context, you guys are much better at making disciples than we are. Would you Would you agree with that? I mean, I would say that is what is being said, <laughs> and and uh, I would say to some extent, I, I I don't I don't totally adhere to those who say that the the, the American church is dying. They can use figures to prove that. They can use uh, church buildings closing down to prove that, but there's still there's still that fire in the church in the U.S., just as there's 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 fire in the church in Africa, and all of us are making disciples each at a specific level based on our story and based on our history, and based on where we find ourselves at this point in time. Hmm. So that's 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 how I that's how I look at it. That's I'm I'm gonna have to think on that because you've actually been in America, you've seen our churches, and then you've been in Africa, obviously, and seen your churches. My understanding is that there is just much more energy, excitement that the that the Holy Spirit is moving much much more across the continent of Africa, and then numerically. Uh, yes, the American church is shrinking. I mean, there are more African Methodists now than there are Americans. It's it's really quite something to behold, and it's uh, it is it is hurting my brain to hear you. What well, not hurting? It's it's hard for me to understand you saying that that we have the same fire here that that is being seen in African Methodism. Because then, what explains if we have the same fire? Then what explains the um, 
the atrophy that we're seeing here, the, 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 the decline. Africa is rising and America is, is falling. What explains that in your mind? So, so Jeffrey, that's, that's, that's what happens when we all want to measure with, with, with we, we want to use some standards that would not apply in every circumstance to measure. I, I would rather say that the, the spirit is moving in a different way hmm. in the U.S. Because I see the spirit moving within churches in the U.S. that I've visited. Mm -hmm. I see the spirit moving in a different way uh, within individuals in the U.S. with whom I've had conversations. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just moving in a different way. And unfortunately, the way it's moving... Uh, is not permitting uh, numerical growth from our own perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's why we would say it is moving in Africa and not in the U.S. Right, yeah. But I would say I've, I have visited, for example, I've visited, there's a church in Texas, Christ United Methodist Church uh, in Plano. And there are wonderful ministries happening within that context. Mm -hmm. And uh, they might not be bringing as many people into the church as they used to do uh, uh, 40 years ago or 30 years ago. But the spirit is now moving in a different way, mm -hmm. which is not in the same way as it is. So it is increasing numbers in Africa and building the church from within. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, in the U.S., like, for example, in the church I just uh, cited, mm -hmm. it is moving in another way, impacting communities within the area where the church is planted, mm -hmm. but not necessarily bringing people into the church in the same way as it is doing in Africa. Mm -hmm. So I would say the spirit is moving just differently. And, and, and I think that's, that's another challenge. That's another thing we might have to learn to look at it differently because that that rhetoric that rhetoric even of the the church in america is dying mm -hmm. the church in africa is growing mm -hmm. is creating a platform for conversations that are not very healthy we don't just see it well the reason the reason i've thought it's healthy and i could be wrong is because um, there are certain practices of the past that in uh, mainline United Methodism in the United States, we have gotten rid of. They bore fruit, but then they, we, we started talking as though we need to do a new thing. We need to stop doing the old things. Even though they worked, we need to stop doing the old things. They make people uncomfortable. We need to do some new things. And, of course, this figures into the current debate. We need to change our stance on sexuality. That will help us minister to the culture. So... Um, that would be the liberal position. The conservative position would be we need to reclaim the old things. We need to talk more about personal holiness. We don't talk about that anymore. We need to have class meetings uh, where we practice daily accountability, walking alongside one another. We need, we need to do evangelism. We need to not just do good works. We need to have the name of Jesus attached to it. We need to make a personal invitation. We need to talk about what happens to people outside of uh, the faith of Jesus Christ and the eternal suffering that awaits them, and we need to reach out to them and try and save them. These are things that early Methodists did well that the church in America does not do very well. But the church in Africa, my understanding, is that it does these things better than in America. So as we're trying to have a healthy conversation about the differences between us, the t posture I have taken is we in the West like to imagine that we are at the height of progress, that we, we, we have discovered everything, we know all the things, and, we're, and that people in other parts of the world, well, they're just behind. You know, like Bishop Minerva Carcano, when she talked about Africans, she said she wished they would just grow up, you know? That's the kind of Western act, uh, uh, attitude we often have. I have seen my posture as being, no, even though we are materially wealthier, people in other parts of the world have things to bring us. And when I spoke with Simon Mafunda, I don't know if you saw that interview or not, he said, I want to send mission groups 
from Africa to America where we can have a revival there. We're in charge, and we can go out to the, the neighborhood. We can invite people, and they can come worship with us, and we'll just see if that is not effective. You know, if that is not more effective than the current things that, that you were trying to do for yourselves. I was very interested in that idea. But to, to listen to you, I, I think you would see that as um, him maybe misunderstanding that we have the same spirit here. We, it's just a different context, and so you have to minister differently here than in Africa. Is that what—did I anticipate what you would say correctly? Yeah, you, you, you did. So w- when I was— when I was preparing for our conversation, mm-hmm. I I read something about the white savior complex. Yeah, that I don't I don't know if you've ever ever heard about this. Mm-hmm. So, listening to what you just said, it's like we would get organized in Africa and go back to the U.S. and make the same mistakes. The American did when they got organized into uh, mission uh, communities, and then came to Africa. So we want to take we want to take God to America mm-hmm. because we think God is not there. Right, and that would be a serious mistake. I mean, but one of one of the things that impressed me during my missionary training was a statement from one of our trainers. And I remember her saying this, as you go into these communities as missionaries, remember that God is already there. Mm -hmm. God is already there. And you are going, going in to testify to how God is at work in that community and to what God is doing within that community. And that's why I said in my uh, previous statement about people saying that the church in the U.S. is dying uh, based on numbers and that there's no fire based on numbers. But that kind of rhetoric prepares a very, very unhealthy platform. So let's take Christ to them because they don't have it. Mm -hmm. Instead of showing up there and watching and witnessing to what God is doing in that context Mm -hmm. and seeking divine direction on how we could be a part of what is happening in that context at that time. So, I mean... So uh, is it that you... So you and I are at a fundamentally different place on that. Because um, I would say that outside of the name of Christ, people cannot be saved. Is that something that that you would disagree with? Well, and I don't want to put you in that position, but for me, if we are not giving people Christ, if we are not coming to them and giving them Christ, then we are letting them uh, die spiritually. And so it's not an act of um, colonialism— or cultural supremacy to bring people Christ. It's an act of love, because I think I can say, yes, God is everywhere, but I can also say Satan is also active in other communities. And if people do not know the name of Jesus, then they are powerless against Satan. So as I look at the history of Western missionaries organizing in societies and going to other parts of the world, I don't want to say that they did everything absolutely perfectly and they never made any mistakes. However, at this point, I rejoice that they did what they did because now I can have Christian brothers in Africa that I would not have if they hadn't done that. And, and I don't think that Christianity should be a white faith. I, I think it's, it's a faith for all peoples. So I think it's a beautiful thing when people bring the name of Christ to other people who seem to either not know who he is or who have forgotten who he is. And as an American, I would say that largely in our popular culture, I think we have forgotten who Jesus is. Um, Most people don't read their Bibles. Most people, they think Jesus was only ever loving and caring and sweet. They don't know the stories of of him arguing in the temple uh, or convicting the, the, the people in power. You know, these are things that need to be taught and proclaimed, and people don't magically know. So, so as I hear you talk about Africans cannot 
replicate the mistakes of the missionary societies that came from the West. I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm going, I really want them to do what missionary societies in the West did. I think there's this wonderful exchange that happens cross-culturally. I had it in seminary in Boston. There were many Korean students there who they were afraid to talk to the, the Anglo students because we're sensitive. But when they understood I was, mm. I was all right, they said, you know, many people in Korea talk about America as a mission field, and we need to come to America. It's not just a one-way relationship. We need to have missionaries going both ways. And I thought, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, but uh, uh, you're nodding your head, so you don't necessarily... Do you think I'm off base in that? Do you think I've misunderstood the dynamics no, at play? No, 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 Jeffrey. Okay. I don't think you are off base. Okay. What, what I'm saying is I don't agree with uh, those who present America as a completely empty place. Okay, yeah, okay where we need to take Christ there. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is they are still, the spirit is still moving there in wonderful ways. Sure. And they have, the churches there have their own struggles. And uh, and I think Glo Global Ministries, the mission agency I work with, right. presents this in a wonderful way. So they have this, uh, this statement about we missionaries, coming from everywhere to everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think it expresses the fact that there's need everywhere for disciples of Christ to be made, right. even in America. And even now, in a growing church in Africa, there's still need for disciples to be made. Right. And... So it's 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 not like so it's it's like the empty glass and it is like the half half full or half empty glass. Mm -hmm. And some would choose to see America at this point as half empty. Right. I, I want to see it as half full. There's still something happening there. But I totally agree with you that uh, bringing in people from other areas where the spirit is very, very active mm -hmm. could be a plus. Good, yes. But if we are bringing them in with the same mistakes, <laughs> like we had brought in missionaries from the West into Africa, I mean, like you said, we are brothers today and having this conversation mm -hmm. because some years ago, missionaries left from Europe and from uh, America into Africa. Mm -hmm. And we both agree that they did a lot of wonderful things, but they also did some things I would believe some of them would regret today doing if they had that understanding that God is already there. Mm -hmm. And that they come to witness to what God is doing mm -hmm. within that community. And I just wanted to uh, say one last thing about yeah, go ahead. Uh, something you said about uh, Christ. I, I believe Christ as Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. So I don't get uncomfortable about making that affirmation. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but I, I don't, unfortunately, maybe I don't agree with those who want to make it seem as if America is completely empty and we need to go fill it up. There, yeah. is still, there are still some wonderful ministries happening there. And like you said it, how do we get these ministries that are impacting communities, the ministries that in addition to impacting communities are making disciples for Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that would lead us to another level. Well, and maybe in a follow-up conversation, because we've already dived pretty deep, and I really appreciate you doing that with me. Um, it's one of, one of the things that I've talked about for years, and if I'm wrong, I still haven't seen it. 
um, I think a lot of harm was, I think a lot of harm is continually done when we use the same words, but we mean very different things by those words. And one of those words is disciple. Um, I, I think a lot of people in leadership in the church have had a very different understanding of what a disciple is, how they live, what they believe, and what's important to a disciple. And because every church would agree that disciple making is important. But in, once you start talking about what kind of disciples we're making, then you'll have a, a lot of disagreement about what is important. Um, mm -hmm. But the reason, uh, you know, where we stand right now is within the United States of America, those churches that have that provision of paragraph 2553 to leave, many of them are choosing to at least have that conversation um, because things have been so dysfunctional for so long that they just think, we need, if we're not going to learn to get along, then we need to separate. Um, my church is going through that discernment process, by the way. Um, one of the things that everybody still agrees on, even though we're in a place of dis deep disagreement, is missions are absolutely essential. Um, that we have to continually go to people who are suffering, be in solidarity with them, encourage them, equip them. Um, and that's the work that you're engaged in, in a situation that many Americans would find very intimidating. Um, and you're, you're not native, uh, I think it would be called Congolese. Uh, con you, you weren't born in Congo, you were born in Cameroon, and that was your first 18, 19 years of life were in Cameroon. And then so, you know, someone from, from my part of the world might hear, missionary from Africa to Africa, no big deal. No, it's just as big a deal as someone from here going there. Um, and you've chosen to, to do what is uncomfortable out of love for others and to try and make a positive difference in the world. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap things up here where I began with just a general thankfulness towards you for spending your life in this way, Collins. Thank you. And thank you very much, Jeffrey. And it's, it's been a time for some very deep conversations and uh, I've, I've learned a lot and uh, thank you for this invitation to be a part of this conversation. Well, as, as you, I'm, I'm hopefully going to continue to have conversations. If, if you continue to watch what I'm doing and you think that I, uh, you're very welcome to follow up with me, tell me things that I, questions I should be asking, you're very welcome to correct me. Um, I hope it's clear as we talk. I do not think I'm an expert on these things. I'm just a person who loves the Wesleyan tradition and the church I grew up in, and um, I'm kind of feeling guilty. I haven't taken the time before now to speak with more African brothers and sisters because it's been very encouraging to me um, and exciting to hear about what God is doing um, across the world. So again, uh, thank you for spending the time with me, and, and I look forward to seeing what, what fruit God bears out of these conversations. Thank you, Jeffrey, and blessings to you, and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Take care, Collins. Blessings. Bye-bye.